So it's my pleasure first uh, to introduce Professor Michelle Foster, uh, who's a Professor and Associate Dean Research at the Melbourne Law School. And Michelle's also the Director of the International Refugee Law Research Program in the Institute for International Law and the Humanities at the Melbourne Law School. And her teaching and research area interests are in the area of public law, international refugee law and international human rights law. Michelle has degrees from the University of Michigan Law School uh, and also holds uh, degrees from the University of New South Wales. And perhaps at this point I should remind everybody that if you have a mobile phone, it would be a good idea to turn it off. I had deliberately asked Charles <laughs> if he could get a call at this point, just because it was an easier way to raise this delicate topic. So thank you, Charles, for <laughs> receiving that call. So prior to her graduate studies, uh, Michelle worked for the Commonwealth Attorney General's Department uh, for the Honourable A.M. Gleeson, uh, who was then Chief Justice of New South Wales and for the New South Wales Solicitor General and Crown Advocate. And Michelle has published widely in the field of international refugee law and her books include The International Refugee Law and Socioeconomic Rights, Refuge from Deprivation and The Law of Refugee Status. And since joining the Melbourne Law School in 2005, Michelle has also advised the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. So as you can see, Michelle is highly qualified and we're delighted to have you speaking with us tonight, Michelle. So what has happened is the little pin has detached from the microphone. So and and oh, yes, it will go. clip. Okay. okay, well thank you so much Helen for that extremely comprehensive introduction. You mentioned things I'd forgotten about, so <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and thank you Tim for the invitation to be here tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. So are the slides? Oh, excellent, thank you. So in recent Australian government rhetoric, much attention has been placed on the need for a regional framework and a regional approach to what is recognised to be a regional, if not, of course, global problem. In fact, many of you may recall that in 2012, when the expert panel issued its report, it focused on both short-term, but in particular medium to long-term solutions, which it really focused on um, the need for an international cooperation framework in that context. So in my brief remarks today, I would like to take us on a journey to interrogate how well the Australian legal system is equipped to implement a responsibility sharing regime that is compliant with international law. And of course, compliance with international law is going to be my focus. I'm going to argue that progressive amendments to the Migration Act and related legislation in recent years have in fact stripped away the important and necessary protections which were identified by the High Court in the Malaysia case in M70 and that these deficiencies in our domestic law are compounded by the lack of a regional human rights framework in the Asia-Pacific region, meaning that we simply do not have the fundamental components of a true responsibility sharing, as opposed to responsibility shifting regime in place at present. So I always like to start, a um, crazy idea I know, but with the Refugee Convention when we're talking about refugee law. And it's really important to reflect on, well, what does the Refugee Convention say about international cooperation? And, of course, it's unsurprising that the framers of the Convention well understood the global challenge that refugee protection presents and the notion that without international cooperation, this burden or this challenge simply cannot be achieved. And so we see in the preamble to the 51 Convention the recognition of the need for international cooperation. Unfortunately, however, that broad principle wasn't then translated into any of the binding articles in the Convention. And so after you know, much sort of scholarly analysis of this issue, the fairly simple conclusion is the one that I've outlined there, which is that the Convention neither expressly authorises nor prohibits reliance on responsibility share, excuse me, sharing regimes. 
Now, over several decades, we now have seen the proliferation of responsibility sharing regimes, both uh, in our own region, of course, but also in other regions of the world. And while some of the academic commentary was initially focused on can we or can't we engage in these regimes, there is now such a proliferation of them, there have been decades of engagement in these regimes, that that debate has moved on. And the focus of both, I think, scholarly work, but also judicial interpretation, is very much on, well, let's assume that these regimes are there, but what constraints, what legal obligations operate so as to constrain these regimes? What sort of considerations do we need to take into account in order to affect them in compliance with international law? Now, I've just set out here a, a bit of a sense of the different regimes. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but it's enough to indicate uh, that these regimes can take different forms, multilateral, bilateral, and I think in Australia's case we could argue it's unilateral. But the other point I want to mention is that because these regimes have been in place, particularly in the context of Europe, where we've had the Dublin regulation in place for decades, we're now in a position where we can recognise or discern a number of important principles that have emerged from a raft of, ju of jurisprudence um, that has arisen in relation to the legality of these regimes. And we can see here that what we can discern from all of these different cases, and I won't, I'm, I've basically here just encapsulated what those key um, points are, uh, are these very specific uh, constraints on how, we, how do we assess whether or not a particular responsibility re sharing regime is compliant with international law, well, here's the way we march through it. We look at whether or not these different principles are complied with. And it's not just uh, jurisprudence that has emerged from Europe and from Canada, for example, but in fact, I've already mentioned the Malaysia case, the M70 decision, and I really want to emphasise how important that decision is because some of you who know a bit about this might be thinking, oh, but we've moved on from there because the Parliament's changed the legislation. But actually, it remains a really important decision because it's one of the few examples across the globe where we have a superior court that had the opportunity to reflect on the extent to which the Refugee Convention itself constrains responsibility sharing regimes. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. So really, a lot of these principles are not just discerned from global jurisprudence, but also from the Malaysia case. So just running through them quickly, the first is that, and it's a fairly logical one, if we're going to share responsibility with another state, we want to share responsibility with a state that has the same legal obligations. And again, that was crucial to the Malaysia case. The problem with that Malaysia solution, of course, was that Malaysia had no legal obligations in respect of asylum seekers or refugees. A second really important point is that we must ensure respect for the cardinal principle of non-reformer, the idea that we can never send a refugee to a place of persecution. And that's absolutely understood. No state would ever query or quibble with that as a fundamental basis of protection. And really importantly, Article 33 both has a substantive and a procedural element. So not only do we need to make sure we don't send refugees to a place of persecution, but that that other place has a system in place to work out who is a refugee. Because if they don't, they're at risk of sending that person home. Um, even though they need protection. Another really important point is that we must ensure respect for other refugee convention rights. Uh, and this is a, a, a sort of a particular respect in which the Malaysia case, the M70 decision, has contributed enormously to the understanding of what constraints operate in international law. So as I said earlier, most of the other cases from the European Court of Human Rights, from the Canadian Federal Court, are really looking at international human rights law more generally. But in the Malaysia case, the court was considering these provisions. I know that's a lot of information for us from a, <laughs> to put on a slide. I don't expect you to sort of take it all in. But essentially, at the time of the Malaysia case, these were the provisions in the Migration Act that dictated whether or not we could engage in any kind of responsibility sharing regime. They weren't actually new. They had been put in place in 2001 when the parliament decided to affect Pacific Solution Mark 1, when it first wanted to send people to Nauru. But it, they weren't actually tested until 2011 when the High Court had the opportunity to consider them in the Malaysia case. Now, what's really important about this is that the Solicitor General for the Commonwealth argued very vigorously before the High Court that that word protection is confined to non-reformer. In other words, we can send people anywhere as long as they're not going to be persecuted there. But as the applicant and as the court agreed, actually the Refugee Convention has many other rights in it. And I'll just flick ahead a little bit to give you another very busy slide, I realise, but it's just trying to give you the sense. There's actually lots of rights in the Refugee Convention other than just Article 33. Why? Because the framers of the Convention understood that a person who's displaced needs to re-establish a life of dignity. And in fact, most of the rights in the Refugee Convention are directed to that end, to ensuring that a person can re-establish a life and therefore have access um, to all sorts of rights like education and the right to work. And the joint judgment in M70 was absolutely adamant that the Convention does contain a wide range of other protections, 
Um, and then when we talk about the word, or when we interpret the word protection, so going back to the legislation at the time, the court said, and I quote from the joint judgment, that this refers to the protections of a kind which Australia has undertaken to provide by signing the Refugee Convention. So we have a really clear four-judge decision um, that provides that background. So understanding, and there's some other points there which I'll come back to, but understanding what the principles are is not difficult. As I say, we have a lot of jurisprudence from other regions and we also have very clear authority from our own High Court as to what's required to engage in responsibility sharing. So let's think about the application of those principles to our own regime or to our own region. And the first point, of course, is shared legal obligations. Now, once you understand what this slide is depicting, you will understand the challenge in our region, because essentially this is a map provided by the UNHCR, which shows us which countries in the world have and have not signed the Refugee Convention. Can anyone guess what the red stands for? Not signing. And where are those countries? In our region. So we've immediately got a challenge, which is that most of the countries that would be part of our regional responsibility sharing regime, whatever that may look like, in fact are not party to the convention. The other really important point, and I did mention this earlier, but I really want to emphasise it, is that there is no binding regional human rights framework. In Europe, the European Convention on Human Rights has proved to be an absolutely crucial method of oversight of protection elsewhere policies. To give you, I mean, there's a wealth of cases, and I won't go through them all, but just to give you two quick examples, more, two of the more notable cases include MSS in Belgium, which found Belgium to be in violation of its obligations by transferring asylum seekers to Greece. And there were two key reasons. One was that the, the Greece doesn't have a very robust system of refugee status determination. Its judicial review procedure is vastly inadequate. But also, really importantly, asylum seekers are effectively living in the street. And so the court said that it was basically subjecting those asylum seekers to inhuman or degrading treatment to send them to a situation where you knew they were likely to be living in the street. Another really important case that, again, has parallels with our own current uh, policy is a case called Hersey in Italy, where Italy was found to have violated its obligations when asylum seekers were intercepted by the Italian Coast, Coast Guard in the Maltese search and rescue zone and then sent back to Libya. So these have really proven to be important constraints on these policies in Europe. But of course, in the Asia Pacific, we do have the Asian Human Rights Declaration, um, but it only provides in Article 16 that everyone has the right to seek and receive asylum in another state in accordance with the laws of such state and applicable international agreements. So it's not even clear that it's actually establishing an independent right. And in any case, it's a declaration, so it's not binding. And it doesn't have, of course, any sort of enforcement mechanism around it. So that's crucial. The other really important point, as I mentioned, is Article 33. Article 33 requires not just that we don't send people to persecution, but that we ensure that when we send a refugee or an asylum seeker to another country, that that country has a procedure in place, that it has an adjudication procedure, that the refugee has meaningful legal and factual opportunity to make the case, and that it's an adequate procedure. So I've said here, for example, the uh, UK House of Lords has emphasised, before it was the Supreme Court, when it was still the House of Lords, emphasised that you need to ensure that that other country has the correct approach to understanding who is a refugee. But in the context of our region, we've already seen that there's a very low ratification, and that's just not an academic question. It means that those obligations, because they don't exist, they also aren't mirrored in domestic law. So in Indonesia, for example, there is no system whereby the Indonesi Indonesian government determines refugee status. Now, the UNHCR is present there and does determine refugee status, but I would actually question whether that is adequate in any case, because the UNHCR is not a state. Um, there's been widespread, and I can see some nodding of heads there, so people may be aware of this. There's a, a robust scholarship now that really critiques UNHCR procedures. Um, it can never provide judicial review, for example, which was one of the elements of the case against Belgium in the MSS decision. So there's a question there about uh, procedures. And of course, in terms of the other rights, and as I said, I know it's a busy slide, but it's giving you a sense of the types of other constraints that operate, uh, there's very grave concerns about uh, whether or not any asylum seekers or refugees have the right to re-establish their life of dignity in accordance with these rights and others um, in countries like Indonesia. I know other speakers will, will be talking about that, so I won't um, say too much about that. So while I focused on Indonesia, I think that map um, depicting the ratifications or lack of indicates that there's a challenge in implementing a responsibility sharing regime that's compliant with international law, that complies with those principles that I outlined at the beginning. So what that means then, I suppose once we understand that, we can understand why the expert panel recognised that to institute such a regional cooperation framework was not a short-term option. 
clearly it's going to require a lot of advocacy, um, a lot of reform in the countries that are actually are part of our region. What's happened since then? Well, rather than embracing the challenge and seeking to advocate um, for those changes in other countries uh, and pursuing, as I say, that medium to longer goal of working through these reforms, the Australian Parliament's response to the High Court articulation of those principles has been a very definite move away from, not closer to, international law. And I really just want to give you two examples because there's quite a few, but I know that I'm running out of time. I'm avoiding Tim <laughs> assiduously here. <laughs> Sorry? Okay. Um, so the first is that, as you probably know, since that time, since 2011, we have in fact reinstituted offshore processing, of course, in Nauru and Manus Island. And I've probably said enough to make you understand that had we remained or retained these provisions in our law, that would be very difficult because I've already indicated that really once the High Court had indicated the extent um, and the robust interpretation of these provisions that it undertook, it made it clear that any continuation or any re-enlivening of offshore processing was going to be difficult. So as I said, the Parliament or the Government decided not to uh, ensure an adequate procedure or adequate reforms in those countries but simply do away with these provisions altogether. So they were essentially deleted from the Act, and we have in their place the following provision, which basically says the only condition for the exercise of the power to transfer, let's just use the shorthand, is that it's in the national interest to designate a country to be a regional processing country. It's the only criterion. Now that, of course, advocates uh, don't take these things lightly, and of course all laying, laying down, and there's been many challenges, uh, even since the Malaysia case, including the decision S156. Um, but perhaps unsurprisingly, the court said what's in the national interest is largely a political question. And I think there's a limit to the extent to which the court can push back um, in the face of such clear legislation. The second really important set of provisions that I think we do need just to reflect on for a moment is the Asylum Legacy Caseload Act, which some of you may be aware of. It received a lot of media at the end of 2014. And as I said earlier, what we've done is essentially retreat quite categorically from international law, and we can see that very clearly in that legislation. Now, it had about 10 schedules, so I'm not going to try to cover them all, but just in shorthand, essentially what it did was to strip out any references to the Refugee Convention from Australian domestic law. So it did that in the context of determining who gets a protection visa on our territory. But I guess for our purposes, in thinking about regional issues, it ensured that there can be no domestic challenge to pushbacks, to, to, to turning back the boats in accordance with Operation Sovereign Borders. So you re recall that Operation Sovereign Borders has its one of its central tenets, the ability of the Australian government to turn back boats. But there had been an issue about the extent to which the, the parliament, or the, rather the executive, had the authority to do that. So what they did in the Caseload Act was to amend the Maritime Powers Act as follows. And again, I know it's a lot of information, but I'll just take you through it quickly. So it now provides very broad powers for an officer to take a vessel or aircraft to any destination in the migration zone or outside the zone, including outside Australia, so anywhere in the world, to detain a vessel or aircraft for any period reasonably required. So that was in response to a concern about some litigation that was ongoing at the time that questioned the ability of the government to basically detain people on the high seas while it decided what to do. It's now clear we can do that but also to detain a person and to take a person to any place. But I think most crucially, Section 75C provides that to avoid doubt, the destination does not have to be in a country, maybe just outside a country, and maybe a vessel. So we can send people anywhere and place them anywhere. But also, we can do that whether or not Australia has an agreement or arrangement with any other country, so we don't care about diplomatic relations, whether or not that country wants the person. And we also don't care whether there's an international obligation or domestic law of that other country. In other words, all the principles I've outlined about ensuring that if you're going to transfer people, that you know, there's certain uh, protections in place are now completely irrelevant. But the, the point that I do want to emphasise here, and the one that I was just discussing with um, some people before tonight, is of most concern, I think, to all of us, is this clear repudiation of international law. We now see in Section 22A1 this notion that the exercise of a power to give an authorisation is not invalid because of a failure to consider international law, because of a defective consideration, or because it's simply inconsistent with Australia's international obligation. Now, for some of you might be thinking, oh, what's the big deal? I've been feeling that we're inconsistent with international law for years. That may be so, but we've never blatantly, in our own legislation, said that this is OK. We've always, and in fact, most countries in the world don't say, I'm blatantly violating international law. They say, no, 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 you know, actually this is the way we interpret it and it's, you know, they're actually not refugees or there's an exception. 
there's usually an attempt to argue that we're still compliant with international law. And so to have such a clear, um, I would argue, repudiation of international law in our legislation is something we should all be concerned about. So, the rhetoric of a longer-term regional solution, I think I've, well, I've argued, and I hope convincingly, is not supported by policy in Australia. The rhetoric may be there, but it's not supported by the policy or the law. And in fact, I know I'm in conclusion, but I'll, I've got two minutes, so I'll just mention this, that even in respect of our resettlement scheme, the government has made clear that the number of persons resettled from Indonesia will remain at very low levels. So according to research by the Australian Parliamentary Library, Australia resettled only 560 refugees who had been determined to be refugees by the UNHCR in Indonesia between 2001 and 2010. So 560 over nine years. Now there has been an increase since 2010, but Minister Morrison announced in November 2014 that Australia will resettle only 450 refugees annually in the future from Indonesia and that no one who was registered with UNHCR after the 1st of July 2014 will be considered for resettlement. As the former Assistant High Commissioner for Refugees and now um, the Vice Chancellor's Fellow at the University of Melbourne, Erica Feller, has emphasised, refugee protection is a global concern and a common trust. This means that responsibility for it is shared, not individual. But it also means that unless this is shouldered widely, it may be borne by none. Given Australia's position, Australia's position as one of the few signatories to the Refugee Convention in our region, we're a country with a generous offshore resettlement scheme and an historically impressive onshore system of refugee status processing, Australia, I would argue, has a responsibility to embark on creating a genuine regional solution that will involve us taking on a role of true leadership, not abdication of international responsibility. Thank you. So thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, it was very useful to start the evening with a detailed account of the legislation before we move into the case studies. Uh, and our next, we're, first we'll, we'll welcome uh, David Mann on arrival and he's having a little breather. Uh, and Professor Susan Kneebone will be speaking next. Susan's a professor, professorial fellow and associate of the Asian Law Centre at the Melbourne Law School. And her recent research, funded by ARC grants, focuses on forced marriage and migration in Southeast and East Asia. She's the author of many articles, including The Bali Process and the Global Refugee Policy in the Asia Pacific region, uh, which she published in the Journal of Refugee Studies. Susan has also written Refugee Protection and the Role of Law Conflicting Identities, Transnational Crime and Human Rights Responses to Human Trafficking in the Greater Mekong Subregion. And Susan tonight uh, will be speaking on Indonesia's conflicted response to the refugees' asylum seekers, Australia's pernicious influence. So please make Susan welcome. this delicate operation. Here we are. Will that work? Thank you, Helen, for that uh, generous introduction, which I wrote. <laughs> and uh, so I do remember <laughs> all of it. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle, for sit setting the scene so beautifully and reminding me of all the nasty things that we have done and thus justifying the title. Um, and thank you, Archie, for, and congratulations to Archie for providing the occasion. I had an opportunity to read through Archie's book this afternoon and can see what a huge amount of valuable work is in it. And I have to say that I have drawn a lot of inspiration in, in recent years from the work of three people in this room, Archie, and McNevin, and Amy Nethery, in fact, because as you'll see, my work has really moved away from strict legal work. You'll find that uh, I'm much more these days of a hybrid person. My PowerPoint is going to reflect that, you'll see. 
Committee. Uh, and um, I, I really do look at the, the politics of situations and work quite a lot with people who do international relations as, as well as looking at the, at the, the uh, straight legal issues. So I begin by pressing something here. I can use that, okay, fine. So first of all, we start off with a nice official uh, PowerPoint and then we move on to something that is perhaps uh, more creative and fitting with the atmosphere of Indonesia. So just a few basics. Um, fortunately, no one has gone ahead of me to give these. Indonesia is a transit country for refugees heading to Australia. That's a, that's a very important point. Uh, it's a country which has its own enormous issues in relation to migration and so forth. So it's quite different to Malaysia and Thailand. So when we start to talk about regional solutions, we need to remember that. Malaysia and Thailand are both destination and transit countries and, and also, of course, uh, are much wealthier countries uh, indeed. Um, Indonesia currently hosts more than 13,000 asylum seekers or, or, or refugees from those countries, um, Iran, Afghanistan, uh, Myanmar and Somalia. And just to give you a little overview of the, the framework of my argument, so we can see if we, we can start earlier, but if we start with around about 1998. This is a very important time in the history of relations between Australia and Indonesia, as we'll see. We see that from 1998 onwards, Indonesian, the Indonesian constitution and laws recognise asylum seekers. There's some interesting nuances in that, but basically there is a recognition of the idea of refugees. Indonesia, of course, had also had experience with refugees during the Comprehensive Plan of Action in the 1970s, and even before before that, in 1956, it had actually joined the African Asian Legal Consultative Organization, which was an outcome of the Bandung Agreement, which was to do with non-alignment with the West, which I think is actually a really interesting moment in time. And as I learned from Nick, I should also mention Nick as another recent inspiration for my work. There was also a circular in 1956 that I didn't know about. So that was, I think, the first indication that, that Indonesia knew about uh, refugee law. Well, in 2000, to just to jump on, there, there was a, a regional cooperation model, sometimes referred to as a regional cooperation arrangement. I actually got a copy of this many years ago in 2001 from the gentleman who was sitting here uh, next to uh, Michelle, David Mann. David, I don't know whether you remember giving me an actual copy of that. It was actually, you know, one of those black and white ones. And so this is later formalised through the Bali process, which, which I've studied in very close detail. And so the story of what happens after this is, is a shift in Indonesian policy from tolerance to detention, which is really a, a, a direct outcome of Australian assistance and direction, including new laws. And a lot of it's done under the Bali process, of course. Um, and so just to remind those of you who, who were perhaps not born at the same time as I was, or um, there, there was this incident in 2001 known as the Am Tampa episode, and this is one of my favourite cartoons. Here we have John Howard with Kofi Annan at the window, uh, and we have John Howard with 435 refugees, 450 Afghans on a boat, and then we have all the, the rest of the world's problems behind us, including, of course, Indonesia's huge problems at that time. And, of course, here is an image of that, that ever so famous incident, the Tampa incident. So my focus is really looking at the uh, Indonesia-Australia relationship and trying to understand what the effect is of Australian policies on 
on development of protection norms in, in Indonesia, on the idea of the Indonesian state, and on the idea of the rule of law. Uh, and we can really consider these from four perspectives. I'm not going to go into all of these in great detail or necessarily in this order, but I'll touch on all of them at some point in this presentation. We can consider this from the point of view of the effect on Indonesian national law. We can consider it in terms of Indonesia's international obligations, and we'll see that Indonesia has in fact signed up to treaties. It does have the basic international obligations there. Uh, I'm also very concerned about the effect of the bilateral relationship itself on the way that refugees and asylum seekers are treated in Indonesia. And here I've drawn a lot of inspiration from, from Angie and, and Anne's work on the effect that this has had actually on how asylum seekers are policed in Indonesia. And I'm also very concerned about Indonesia in the region, its role in the region. Uh, and a lot of this draws on, on observations I've made over the years years in doing my work on human trafficking, interviewing people about labour migration, teaching Indonesian students, um, and, and also attending a conference a few years ago on human trafficking uh, in, in Indonesia. So I think we get a very very black and white picture of what Indonesia is doing if we only look at refugee law and don't also put it into this context. So very briefly, that's what um, my work has been doing. Um, and in particular, I'm very interested in this bilateral arrangement and the effect that it has on uh, or the, oper the way it operates in terms of the division of responsibility between UNHCR and IOM. And I think, you know, this is, again, something where we see the Australian government has had a huge role in terms of, of um, funding each of these organisations. So, um, basically, under the regional cooperation model, UNHCR has a role uh, to... Uh, conduct refugee status determination and to work to make decisions about resettlement. Uh, UNHCR describes its work on its website as to create community empowerment and self-reliance. Uh, and I think it's really important to understand that refugees within Indonesia rely on UNHCR as a kind of quasi-state organisation, even if it's not. So these are all very important ideas in terms of, of shaping what is happening in Indonesia and the way that uh, people think about Indonesia's obligations. The regional cooperation model also defines the role of IOM, and then it was further redefined in 2007 with another uh, project which has led to 13 immigration detention centres which are managed by o IOM and funded by Australia, uh, which receives quite a lot more funding than UNHCR, which basically receives only 6% of its budget, so they tell us. So, which framing of the issue prevails in Indonesia? Maybe this is not a hard question for you to answer, but actually it's a little bit more complex than, than, than you, you might think. So, the picture that I'm setting up is that we do have this conflicted response, whereas we do have on the books in Indonesia, indeed, uh, a human rights protection recognition I mean, I know that in the, the, the 2000s I was actually helping train Indonesian officials in refugee law at Monash University. I also spoke to a group of Indonesian officials who came to study refugee status determination. They know about refugee law. And yet, when we see uh, what has happened with Indonesia's laws, we find that despite the fact that we have uh, provisions in Indonesia's laws which recognise the rights of asylum seekers and also recognise the role of UNHCR, it is the deterrent control side of this equation which, has, uh, out, which outweighs the human rights protection idea. So although Indonesia had a law, a 1992 immigration law, which uh, was 
was you know, a perfectly normal sort of immigration control piece uh, because it talked about sovereignty and also talked about the rule of law. A new law was made in 2011, which was, we believe, it's been very hard to find information, whereas there's a lot of openness about some aspects of Australia-Indonesia cooperation. It's very hard to find information on this aspect, but we believe that Australia was very instrumental in helping the, fun, the uh, drafting of that. Uh, and unlike, uh, sorry, as in Australia, there is no specific ref, uh, visa for refugees, and so studies of how asylum seekers actually get to Indonesia show that they, in fact, can only enter illegally, and of course they have to run the gamut of society, of border officials, of uh, policemen, of other people and hope that nobody dobs them in in order to live in Indonesia and come under UNHCR's protection. So this is the picture, this is the conflicted picture that we have, uh, a, a story of a country which within the region is actually more tolerant of these issues than for example, Malaysia and Thailand, uh, a country which recognises these principles, which is actually very proud, for example, of its involvement in the ALCO ex Bandung principles, uh, but which indeed, through Australia's influence, has introduced a very deterrent policy and a system whereby asylum seekers have to enter as illegal immigrants, as irregular migrants, in order to gain access to uh, a safe place. So, the effect of Australia's laws, in other words, uh, as a, a, uh, sorry, the effect of Indonesia's laws as are Australia's are designed to make asylum seekers irreg irregular. This, this effectively is my argument, that there are deliberate policies now in the Indonesian law on preventing movement, even though the 2011 law in its preamble in fact talks about the movement of of people about globalization and how people are moving around the world, it's quite strange that it then doesn't go on to implement that idea. And then, I think these are probably some quotes from my friends here, uh, within Indonesia we find that asylum seekers are subject to uh, all sorts of practices which, put them, their life, which, which puts their, their situation at risk. So, my argument, therefore, is, is basically that, sorry, no, we won't go on to that just yet, is, is that this is not good for Indonesia, it's not good to have this conflicted role, it's not good to have this role model in the region. Um, we basically do have a window of opportunity at the moment because we have countries in the region for one year hosting uh, Rohingya asylum seekers. Indonesia itself has in fact shown some independence from these on these issues. Indonesia and Australia are the two chairs of the Bali process. The Bali process arises not only out of this regional cooperation model, but also out of um, other instruments. But Indonesia in recent years has stepped aside from the Bali process on several occasions uh, and worked with UNHCR in particular and with other countries in the region. Uh, it, uh, had a pushback policy at one stage, uh, but we know that it has stood up to Australia j again just in recent weeks. And indeed, although there was some, some contradictory behaviour during the Rohingya crisis, at when the countries in the region came together in May 2015, Indonesia did say that it would no longer pursue its pushback policy. So I think we have to remember that Indonesia is doing Australia's bidding in some ways. I think I, I, I cannot forget uh, one particular Indonesian official saying at a conference I was at that, that really this, this Australian focus on our southern waters is very irritating. We're much more interested in what's happening at the north where our trading goes on and so forth. And I think we tend to have a bit of a myopic view in Australia about how Indonesia works. But 
Um, that, I think, is, is a really important um, perspective on Indonesia to understand that it does understand these principles and that Australia's influence is really, as, uh, as a journalist said, uh, had a pernicious influence on the development and promotion of protection norms in Indonesia. And I think that is the end of my presentation. Yes, it is. So I think that was the, the point at which I wanted to finish and to say that there is still this window of opportunity and we can really use Indonesia if we want to promote regional protection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, and we're gradually moving into Indonesia, but we're going to pause and focus more on Australia and the region as a whole. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Mr David Mann. So David is a human rights lawyer and migration agent, and he's the executive director of Refugee Legal. David's worked in various capacities assisting refugees and asylum seekers over 20 years. David sat on the board of the Refugee Council of Australia for seven years, and he currently sits on a number of other non-government boards, uh, including the Victorian Foundation for the Survivors of Torture Ethics Committee. He's been appointed to the UN High Commission for Refugees Advisory Board of Eminent Persons. And David has been the recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including the Law Institute of Victoria, Paul Baker, Prize for Administrative and Human Rights Law, the Law Institute President's Award, and he was shortlisted for the Australian Human Rights Commission Human Rights Medal in 2011. David uh, headed uh, Refugee Legal's legal teams in the recent successful High Court challenges in the cases regarding the government's offshore processing regime in Australia, the Malaysia Solution Case, the case regarding security assessment and indefinite detention of a refugee, the case regarding indefinite detention of a refugee on security grounds, a challenge by a 15-year-old unaccompanied refugee in relation to the government's attempt to bar permanent protection through a visa cap, and also a challenge to a government regulation designed to bar boat arrivals from permanent protection. So from that we can see how lucky we are to have David speaking with us tonight and uh, I hope you will all welcome him. Thank you. Uh, Oops, I think it has to be. Yeah. Yes. Good. Well, thank you very much. I, um, I think they sent the long version there of the, uh, the bio, but... Um, but thanks very much, um, and um, thanks for the other presentations uh, so far. I am um, I'm very honoured to be invited to this forum on what I think is a really important um, uh, launch. I mean, it's a it's a really important issue and a very important book um, that we're launching tonight. It's an issue of great importance, um, the, the issue of um, asylum seekers in the Australia Indonesia relationship, and. Um, I wanted to really start in terms of the importance by um, referring to an event about a year ago um, uh, in our region. And um, it started, or really a series of events, but it started in early May uh, with uh, the discovery of 30 mass graves in, sa in southern Thailand uh, and, and bodies in those graves believed to be uh, asylum seekers or refugees, Rohingya refugees who had fled from Myanmar. Um, the next uh, uh, event in, in May, as you may remember, uh, involved um, Rohingya people seeking asylum um, being pushed back by um, Malaysia, by Thailand and by Indonesia uh, into the sea, into the Andaman Sea. And it resulted in 8,000 people being stranded in the Andaman Sea, uh, emaciated and desperate, without food and water and um, you know, bound to die without um, being rescued. Um, there were the um, serial denials and finger pointing and refusal to accept responsibility by the states in question. Uh, and uh, there was 
At the same time, something somewhat unusual, I think, in this context, and that was a very strong response by the international community uh, to do something, uh, to render rescue. And uh, what actually happened as a result of that was that there was a trilateral meeting between Malaysia, uh, Indonesia and Thailand, and it resulted in Malaysia and Thailand, not uh, sorry, be by Malaysia and Indonesia, not Thailand, saying that they would stop towing, uh, towing boats back into the sea and take in the asylum seekers as long as they uh, could be resettled within a year. Um, Australia's then Prime Minister Tony Abbott um, uh, said uh, that the crisis uh, was primarily a Southeast Asian um, issue. And in response to the question of whether Australia would come to the party in terms of assisting with resettlement of refugees in this context, uh, he infamously said, nope, nope, nope. That was the response of our country. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, Indonesia, Indonesia said in response that Australia was obliged to take some responsibility for Rohingya refugees, uh, to which Australia extraordinarily said, Actually, here, Burma is the culprit. It's, a, it's an issue for Burma. That is, in other words, that the persecutor uh, was responsible uh, for the issue and needed to, I assume, take responsibility for it. Um, it's hard to know what to make of those comments, but I think it's very important as a backdrop to the issue at stake here. Um, at the time, I was actually asked by The Guardian uh, to be on a panel of experts on how to solve the impossible question of how to solve the crisis. And we formed a chorus, this, so, this uh, panel of so-called experts, uh, we formed a chorus which was really um, a clarion call for an urgent uh, regional and humanitarian response. And I urged, as part of that, um, that Malaysia, Thailand and Indonesia should immediately cease their pushback of boats and render rescue and humanitarian aid. Humanity must be put before politics and rescue at sea before border enforcement. Australia must show regional leadership by doing all within its power and capacity to save lives at sea through emergency logistical, financial and humanitarian assistance. Many of the asylum seekers at sea are stranded and suffering from starvation, having been pushed back from seeking refuge in Thailand, Malaysia uh, or Indonesia. Australia should urge joint operations between key states to rescue these people and then should work with other countries to provide vital assistance which ensures that these people are humanely treated, that their claims are fairly assessed and that those in need of protection are resettled to safety. Deterrence of asylum seekers has nothing to, does nothing to address the desperation and dangers which force people to flee. Deterrence just sweeps people from one doorstep to dangers and possible death elsewhere. Nations in our region must stop constructing a fortress around the bloodied fields in front of them. What we need is for these countries and the international community to come together and uphold the existing protection obligations which erode to desperate people fleeing from persecution and to strengthen strategies which are firmly founded in human dignity, human rights and international cooperation. So far, so good. Um, but here I also wanted to um, take us briefly uh, to the powerful parallels that I think are also at play with people, uh, for people stuck in Indonesia as a result of this dynamic and the growing blockades in Europe uh, where humanitarianism has, all, uh, has, has really all got jammed jammed up due to politics driven by popular hostility to a regular movement of people in Europe, which has led to some countries putting up blockages and jamming desperate efforts to find safety. The same is happening in Indonesia as a result in part of the relationship between Australia and Indonesia. And despite the discordance between Indonesia and Australia, in truth, both are co-conspirators in the asylum blockade. The Ottoman Sea and European crises really are both microcosms of one of the great global challenges 
of our times, and that is we really live, I think, in a new era of migration, of mass forced migration on an unprecedented scale. Migration here includes asylum. When I refer to migration, it includes asylum, it includes flight by refugees, as well as people displaced by environmental factors. And I just wanted to, to give you a snapshot of what I mean by the global crisis, because it really, the, the, the situation in Australia, between Australia and Indonesia on asylum, as I say, is a mere microcosm of a far greater crisis. There are 60 million people who have been uprooted, uh, forced to flee from their homes due to persecution, due to war and human rights abuses. 60 million boys, girls, men and women. Numbers fleeing are rising sharply on a daily basis. And of the 60 million, almost 14 million were newly displaced last year. In the last three years, there's been a 40% increase globally. 42,500 people are forced to flee each day. Each day, 42,500 people. 51% of refugees are children. And on current figures, a baby boy born in a refugee camp will likely die an old man there. So that's the global um, scale. Now, I'm here as a, a refugee and a human rights lawyer, but I don't really want to focus on refugee law here, um, not primarily, and Michelle has um, given a, a very compelling account of the legal issues at stake. But really what I wanted to do is go to what I see as really the central problem uh, being that Indonesia, like most other regional neighbours, has not committed to a rule of law framework to protect refugees. And Australia, as a co-conspirator really, in many ways, has engaged in an incremental uh, and fundamental repudiation of the legal framework uh, that it's committed to, that we're, that we're obliged to, to meet. Both countries are in practice engaged in burden shirking, in burden shifting, not sharing, when it comes to processing and protection of refugees. And yet the international framework for protection of refugees is predicated on the very opposite. It's predicated on sharing the responsibility for refugees. If all countries in the world engaged in a, a, essentially a systematic program of deterrence, the whole international framework for protection would collapse. The law and legal framework certainly have an important role to play. Um, and much has been written and said on the need to develop a regional cooperation framework for refugee protection. But what I really wanted to do is, is, is focus um, for a moment um, on law as an instrument of social policy. Courts can rule and laws can be made and operate to set out rules, but they must operate with a serious social commitment. And this presents as a particularly significant and acute problem in our region including in Indonesia, particularly in Indonesia. It's not a situation where we can only seek legal remedies through construction of a new legal architecture rooted in international treaties like the Refugees Convention. We have a very serious disjunction between legal frameworks and public attitudes, both here and in our region, including Indonesia. Now, yes, the law and legal frameworks have an important role to play, but unless they work in concert with other strategies, with governments and others in civil society, to build a shift, a significant shift in public sentiment, people seeking safety will pay the price. They'll continue to pay the price um, in the way that we saw in the Ottoman Sea, stranded at sea. Many bemoan the lack of signatories in our region and bemoan the lack of legal frameworks, uh, including in Indonesia. But adopting a legal framework, I think we need to, well, in, in, in adopting a legal, in, in this call for adopting legal frameworks, I think we need to confront a fundamental fact, and that is that uh, the adoption may well be at odds with public sentiment in Indonesia and other countries in the region. You know, um, we, um, th there's often the call, which, which comes in various ways, but but along the lines of we have to encourage governments like Indonesia to sign up to, to treaties like the Refugees Convention. And there have been endless attempts by the UNHCR and Western countries for Indonesia to do so. 
I'm going to ask a question somewhat provocatively. Why would they? Why would they do that? Um, promoting, um, promoting adequate standards, promoting practical protection underpinned by work and civil society may well be a better approach at this point rather than uh, calls for Indonesia and other countries in the region to sign up to treaties which are not backed by support in civil society at present. I, I should share a very brief anecdote with you on this point that many years ago I headed up, uh, 2006, I headed up the legal team for the 43 West Papuans who came to Australia seeking asylum, seeking protection. And um, uh, uh, not long afterwards, uh, an annual visiting um, group uh, from Indonesia, including academics, journalists, politicians, I think. Um, I gave an annual sort of lecture or class to this group each year. And um, I started my, my normal sort of lecture uh, about human rights and the rule of law in Australia. And I could tell that no one had uh, the vaguest interest in what I was saying because heavy in the room was the question of why 43 West Papuans had been granted uh, international protection, why they'd been granted refugee status in Australia. And we engaged in the next two hours in a fascinating discussion. And one of the things that I found most important and interesting was that a lot of the questions um, revolved around um, the political dimensions of human rights and the rule of law, and questions around um, you know, the, the, what were considered to be highly politicised considerations uh, which had been brought to bear uh, on the decisions. Whether or not that's correct or not, I'm not making any comment on, but what, what the discussion, um, I think, um, threw up sharply was quite different views about human rights and the rule of law, um, which uh, can be brought to bear in the relationship between the two countries, and, and differences which must be taken seriously um, by both, by both countries and which I don't think are. They're part of this disjunction. Um, can I also say here that um, sometimes there are times where issues become so complex, the challenge is so great, that uh, we need to work not with solutions, but with better approaches, or just approaches. And I think this is one of them, the question about uh, asylum in our region and the relationship with Australia and Indonesia. I don't think we should be talking about solutions, but about broad approaches. And here, I should say, comes in the value of a wonderful book uh, on the issue, because uh, books like the one that's being launched tonight uh, provide a much deeper understanding uh, of the region and um, also of who we might want to influence if we are to build a better uh, protection system in the region. Discussions about regional frameworks often, frankly, converge on proposals uh, to throw lots of money and other resources at Indonesia and other regional neighbours in return for them signing up to the Refugees Convention. Clearly, a deeper understanding is needed. And in fact, Australian policies are really, in many respects, not that different from those of governments in our region, including Indonesia, when it comes to the question of asylum. You know, uh, we're a bad example, it's often said, of Australia now. Well, I'll ask a question, where are the good ones? Um, there is a consensus, it seems, that we need um, regional approaches on these issues. Well, can I say this, that it's, it's rarely ever, I think, mentioned that we actually already have a regional approach. It's always said that we need a, reg a, a regional framework. We actually have one and it's driven by deterrence. Um, if, however, Australia adopted a different approach, a better approach uh, to the question of asylum, which didn't involve um, pushbacks, which didn't involve mandatory indefinite detention, which didn't involve human warehousing in countries like Nauru and PNG, um, what we also would need to have, I think, is a deeper understanding of just how difficult it would be, and will be, I hope, will be, to build a better protection system in the region. But at the moment, with Australia um, uh, engaging in activities which are essentially, uh, you know, essentially part of a regional deterrence system in our region, um, 
Australia's approach merely serves, I think, to feed into uh, the very system uh, which, which is at odds with what we need and to also undermine efforts to build a better system. I should also say, somewhat darkly, um, that uh, the lack of generosity that we see in our region toward refugees is actually a global phenomenon. It's not just a phenomenon of Australia and Indonesia engaged in pushbacks and turnbacks. Turnbacks are a global phenomenon and they're on the rise. Um, uh, just have a look at what's happening in Europe at the moment, unfolding in Europe. What we need are better standards and common standards and, if possible, the development of rule of law frameworks in our region. But unless they are underpinned by public sentiment in support of these, uh, of these uh, measures, built patiently, carefully and patiently, taking into account shared interests, forging genuine partnerships in our region, um, unless they are, um, I think that what we're going to be left with uh, is endless attempts by lawyers, by the UN, by UN agencies and international agencies to, in a sense, foist upon the region uh, mechanisms which don't actually have true support. And, in fact, I actually think that the best approach would be for those groups of lawyers and, you know, and, and the UN, UN agencies and international agencies really, ultimately not to consider themselves at the vanguard of change, but just as part of it, uh, building a better system within civil societies. In other words, any change which is going to better protect refugees in our region is going to have to find, I think, it's going to have to come from and find inspiration from within civil society itself. Now, I grant you this is a, a, a very big... Uh, and, uh, but a fundamental project. Um, and really, frankly, I've come to think the more that people talk about a regional framework uh, and the more, uh, that, uh, more time that goes on without any real progress on that front, I've come to really think uh, that it's not only a very big and fundamental project, but one involving change on the scale of no less than abolition of slavery or women's rights. I really think that the type of change we're looking at it requires nothing short of a mass moral shift uh, in our region, and I think globally, more broadly. It requires a seismic shift in civil society sentiment, and um, I, I think that if you look at the figures now, and I'll come back to the, the, some simple figures, I mentioned that there are 60 million uh, forcibly displaced worldwide, there are only 80,000 resettlement places worldwide at the moment for refugees, 80,000. Um, uh, Europe recently committed to 160 additional places, uh, 160,000 additional places, but a deal which essentially can't be completed. Um, so we know that there will be huge future challenges. We know that there will be challenges uh, driven by conflict. We know that there will be mass migration uh, not only due to conflict, but also due to the effects of climate change and rising sea levels. Um, you know, in Bangladesh now, um, annually, there are 50,000 people having to move to the city because of rising sea levels. It's happening now, and it's actually part of our future. But I think a big question for us all, and it comes back to uh, in the Indonesia-Australia relationship as a microcosm, is um, in that context, who and how many people will be given shelter and on what basis and under what, and, and under what frameworks. The Indonesia and Australia relationship and the people stuck in limbo is a microcosm of what's unfolding globally and the fact, as I mentioned before, is that countries are turning back people uh, all over the place, um, all around the world. Um, the 8,000 refugees stranded at sea is really a metaphor uh, for people who are not only at sea but on land. And if we are going to um, build a better protection system in our region, if Australia and Indonesia and its relationship is not going to uh, render so many desperate people in need of protection uh, stranded, stuck, blocked, we're actually going to have in both of our societies, we're going to have to have a significant shift in the way that we think uh, in, not only in a legal sense, but I think in a moral sense.
Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for placing the issue in a very broad context and in a very nuanced one so that we can see the entire region. Uh, what we'll be having now, yes, you can come up. What we'll be having now, and you can be putting that on and I'll just chat with my loud voice. Uh, Ancha will now be talking about a specific case study in Indonesia. Uh, and she'll be talking on displaced, exploited and almost forgotten Rohingya refugees and life in a refugee camp in Indonesia. So Ancha is a senior fellow at Monash University and from 2012 to 2015, uh, she was a McKinsey postdoctoral fellow here at Melbourne Law School, so is no stranger to us. Um, Ancha's research interests include trans transit migration, diaspora politics, as well as border and mobility studies. Ancha studied Southeast Asian studies and anthropology at Humboldt University in Berlin and obtained a PhD from the Australian National University for a thesis about long distance politics of the Achenese diaspora. However, in recent years, Ancha has focused on asylum seekers in transit in Indonesia and on people smuggling networks in Indonesia. And her latest publication, prior to the one being launched tonight, uh, was linking people, connections and encounters between Australians and Indonesians, uh, which she produced with Gemma Purdy uh, just last year. So thank you very much, Ancha, and please welcome her. not moving. Um, anyway, thank you everybody for coming and um, thanks for staying. Uh, and my talk, I want to uh, address the destiny of the Rohingya uh, and what happened to them during their temporary stay in Aceh in Indonesia. And the reason for doing this um, is that the Indonesian government treated this Rohingya quite differently compared to other asylum seekers and refugees there. Um, most of you <laughs> might still remember, and David has brought up the topic uh, about the Rohingya earlier, of how they were stranded at sea and how Achenese fishermen um, went out to rescue hundreds of dehydrated and emaciated people drifting in boats uh, off the coast of Aceh. And um, the point here is to show you lots of pictures, so I hope we really get this uh, PowerPoint to work. Um, Since 2012, a series of violent riots between ethnic Buddhists and Rohingya Muslims um, uh, has escalated the conflict in Rakhine State. Over 100,000 uh, Rohingya have been displayed in, displaced inside Myanmar and tens of thousands have fled to neighboring Bangladesh. But Bangladesh denies them rights as well. Since about 2014, approximately 94,000 refugees and migrants have departed by sea from Bangladesh and Myanmar due to a systematic persecution. Many of the Rohingyas were driven into the arms of people smugglers hoping to reach Malaysia, uh, either by land or by sea. So after the discovery of mass craze, as David mentioned before, in the remote jungles uh, along the Thai-Malaysian border, the police started to crack down on smuggling networks and the smugglers abandoned uh, their Rohingya clients uh, in the boats drifting uh, on the Andaman Sea. Fearing that uh, more people would come after these clampdowns, the naval authorities in Indonesia, Thailand and Malaysia decided to prevent those boats from disembarking and uh, in several instances they gave people on board food and, uh, and water and fuel but pushed them back into the sea. So this... Um, Deadly ping pong uh, left hundreds of uh, Rohingya stuck at sea for more than a week. And finally, due to international pressure, Malaysia, Indonesia and Thailand reached a joint agreement. As we have heard before, Indonesia and Malaysia pledged uh, to take 7,000 people and allow them to be processed in their respective territories. But the condition was that the international community would have to bear all financial responsibilities. Um, what might have appeared as a, mag a magnanimous uh, gesture, as a great gesture at the first glance, was actually less impressive if you take a closer look, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, 
So Indonesia and Malaysia offer temporary shelter only, insisting that the resettlement and the repatriation process must be completed within one year. It was very clear at the very time this agreement was made that the time frame was unrealistic because in Indonesia, refugee and status determination procedures that can take between two and four years, waiting for the actual resettlement to come through will take a few more years if it happens at all. So none of the asylum seekers uh, that had come to Indonesia, and most of them, as Susan has told you, are from Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran, has ever been subject to such a restrictive, restrictive limit. Um, bearing in mind that the state-driven research and rescue operations might have come a little bit too late, at least 1,800 people came to the shore in Aceh. A large percentage of them were actually women and minors. Approximately 1,000 people identified themselves as Rohingya, whereas the others said they were from Bangladesh. And this is important because um, the Rohingya and the Bangladeshi, they were housed in different places. And those people who said they were from Bangladesh, it was about 640, um, were then voluntarily repatriated to Bangladesh. Considering the lack of transparency about the procedures adopted in the registration procedures, it is, might as well be possible that there were, in fact, some Rohingya among the Bose people who um, voluntarily went back. Um, Myanmar, from the very beginning, refused to co cooperate in the repatriation process. Probably a good thing. Um, the local authorities in Aceh were hoping to integrate um, the Rohingya quickly into the local communities, but they were unable to do so because national restrictions prohibit refugees from integration. Instead, uh, in order to prevent spontaneous integration, the Rohingya were accommodated in camps. But as is widely known, um, camps are quite expensive to maintain, but living in camps is also quite detrimental to the well-being of the people kept there. So in Aceh, there are four spots where the uh, Rohingya were put, and the conditions uh, differ quite, quite a bit uh, from camp to camp. Uh, and I will show you some... Um, Pictures. Uh, in some of the camps, uh, the Rohingya live in tents. In other camps, they live in barracks. Sometimes families are allowed to live together, while on other sides, men and women are separated. Uh, Amnesty International has said that the camps fail to meet even basic uh, needs of the Rohingya. Sanitation is poor. The tents provide only uh, little protection from bad weather. And you, can, you, you can see uh, what these uh, tents look like. And more importantly, there has also been uh, significant threats to the uh, security of the Rohingya hosted these uh, camps. Abuse by security staff, lack of protection from smugglers and traffickers, but also instances of local gangs entering the camps to rob asylum seekers have been reported. One incident that stood out last year in September was when four women stood uh, up and said that uh, they uh, had experienced sexual assaults. Um, it stood out uh, not because the police then did a thorough um, investigation, but rather because most of the other people from the camp stormed out and, and uh, started hiding in the forest for several days. Um, there are, however, important uh, differences in the way uh, that the Rohingya have been treated compared to other asylum seekers, uh, the thing that I wanted to uh, uh, focus on tonight. So on the one hand, as uh, asylum seekers and refugees, they do not have uh, the right to work, they don't have access to education, and um, there's no chance for them to ever become an Indonesian citizen or to integrate into society. However, as a persecuted Southeast Asian Muslim minority, the Rohingya have seen unprecedented uh, acts of solidarity from Indonesian individuals and organizations. So after they had arrived, food and clothes were sent to these camps, particularly during uh, Muslim holidays, sometimes much more than what was needed. Nowadays, um, the donations are starting to try out. And in the picture, you see like a big pile of clothes that people just brought to the camps. Nobody needed that many. Um, the other uh, issue that kind of stands out in regard to the Rohingya is that there was much greater concern for the plight of the Rohingya amongst Indonesian civil society organizations, uh, which had hitherto shown very little concern for asylum seeker issues. But their limited experience and the unfamiliarity uh, with international standards of care for, of care for asylum seekers and uh, refugees made the involvement of some of these organizations rather problematic. For example, some organizations um, received plenty of donations, but the quality of the shelters that they built was actually rather poor. 
Local authorities in some of the camps also complained that the interference of these uh, NGOs actually uh, started to undermine security arrangements, arrangements and conflicted with rights provision. And just to give you an example, in one of the camps, uh, a local NGO uh, arranged marriages, including for underage girls, because they considered it inappropriate for uh, unmarried women and men to live together in the same camp. And that's probably something rather specific for us, yeah? Um, so Indonesia does not allow for the local integration of refugees, um, so Rohingyas can in a way only hope for resettlement. With the limited resettlement capacity worldwide, and David has uh, explained that, less than 1% of all refugees worldwide are resettled uh, into a safe third country. So the, the hopes of the Rohingyas might actually be rather misplaced because the Rohingya are in a way at the very bottom end of the desirability scale for refugees because most of them have no formal education or they are illiterate. Australia has made it clear in May 2015 that it would not resettle any Rohingya from this um, particular uh, Rohingya crisis. So far from what we know, only three Rohingya from Aceh have been resettled in Canada lingering in the camps with nothing to do and unable to earn a living, most of the Rohingyas are stuck. And um, actually, in order to overcome this stuckness, uh, most of the Rohingya have actually started to abscond from those camps, hoping to reach Malaysia. The only way to reach Malaysia, the only way to cross uh, over the Straits of uh, Malacca is, of course, to rely once again on, this, on the facilitation of, uh, by smugglers. So at the end of January this year, basically there were only 275 uh, Rohingya still in these four camps. So the starting number was 1,800, 600 went voluntarily back to Bangladesh, and now there's only 200 and probably uh, less by day. Um, so in a way, once this one-year deadline expires, uh, the Rohingya might have already vanished uh, from Indonesia. So at this point of time, it's quite unclear what will happen um, to the Rohingya in Aceh. Um, it's true, in the second half of 2015, uh, only 1,600 people departed from the Bay of Bengal because of the increased scrutiny of authorities, both at the departure and the arrival points. Um, depending on the current political transition in Myanmar, well, there might be some improvement for the Rohingyas, but maybe not. So, it cannot be ruled out that more Rohingyas will be coming in the future. But even if no more Rohingya have to flee, I guess Indonesia and its neighbor need to develop strategies on what to do in case of a future mass displacement in the region. So as has been stressed uh, on a number, of, uh, uh, a number of times tonight, none of the uh, countries, um, or most of the countries in the region, including Indonesia, have not signed on to the Refugee Convention. They do not provide effective protection for refugees and they don't have a legal framework on how to handle asylum seekers coming to the territories for protection. Um, and they're most likely very unlikely to sign this convention anytime soon. However, interestingly, over the last couple of uh, decades, Indonesia has been actually quite interested in building regional collaborations, all sorts of collaborations. Um, the main regional forums in charge of irregular migration and forced displacement, such as, for example, the Bali process, which has been mentioned before, but also the Jakarta declaration process, and even ASEAN, which, after all, issued um, an ASEAN human rights declaration that affirms the right to uh, asylum. However, all of these regional forums, they have not played a leading role in addressing the Rohingya issue, unfortunately. Despite a number of emergency meetings, no action has been taken. And it's quite regrettable because the Rohingya case, in a way, could have presented an opportunity to build something of a regional architecture for protection-oriented framework on how to handle mass displacement in the Asia-Pacific. So while we're waiting uh, for some regional initiatives to come through, and there's going to be uh, ministerial meetings of the Bali process coming up in, uh, next week, um, it might still be worth to consider alternative options for current and future forcibly displaced people seeking protection in Southeast Asia. So if return to the country of origin is not an option and if resettlement is not going to come through, that pretty much leaves only one um, viable opportunity, which is uh, local integration. Um, and I'm just going to mention this here as maybe uh, something we can discuss later. But 
is it really impossible for 250 million people countries like Indonesia to integrate 1,800 uh, Rohingya? Well, that's something that could be asked. Um, I forgot to explain this picture, actually. Um, so I mentioned that most of the Rohingyas have actually absconded, and I put uh, up this picture because at some point the Indonesian government was thinking about combining these four camps, and they started clearing a, a piece of land, uh, an old uh, palm, oil, a palm oil plantation, put up a big sign uh, signboard that this will be some sort of nicely designed shelter for the Rohingya, but well, it was an initiative, and, and a month later it was clear there aren't actually enough people for this uh, project to come through. So, just as an explanation. Um, let me briefly conclude. Um, on the one hand, um, we have to uh, recognize Indonesia's role in accommodating the Rohingya who arrived in May 2015. So that's important. None of the Rohingyas was forced to go back to Myanmar from this regard, Indonesia uh, fulfills the customary international law obligation to respect the principle of non refoulement which prohibits the transfer of asylum seekers to another place uh, where they might face persecution or abuse. However, as I pointed out, it remains open to questions on whether the re repatriation of people back to Bangladesh put them under risk of persecution and human rights violations. Um, responding to the emergency at sea, the Indonesian government granted temporary residence to the Rohingya until May 2016. They devoted resources to accommodating them and provided uh, for basic needs. The local government in Aceh has assisted very much with the humanitarian response and so has um, uh, a number of NGOs uh, done by giving water, food, medical uh, care and so on and so on. Um, however, uh, rather than responding in this kind of ad hoc menace, I guess Indonesia needs to establish a proper legal framework for handling asylum seekers and refugees. And this call has actually been heard within the Indonesian uh, press uh, since the arrival of um, the Rohingya last year in May. Both NGOs and authorities alike have urged the Indonesian government to enact the presidential decree on handling asylum seekers and uh, refugees um, that has been in the making for several years. I think not only would such a legal provision fill a significant legal gap, but when, uh, when, when applied consistently, it might also provide more fairness and equal treatment for all asylum seekers and refugees uh, in Indonesia. And I put up um, a little table that might be hard to be recognized from the back seats, but um, it basically shows here the uh, monthly registrations um, at the UNHCR in, in Jakarta. So you can see it ranges between 180 and 360 um, people each month that are still coming to Indonesia, and I guess that's a good enough reason to come up with this um, presidential decree. Um, before I end, I would like to point out uh, there's a special edition uh, on asylum seekers and refugees uh, published in Inside Indonesia, so if you're interested in the topic, please check out the webpage. Uh, it has been edited uh, by Nick Tan and me. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Amche, and uh, we now have...